I, uh, I, I have to, uh, we were talking about the idea of vintage this morning, and with our series this today and throughout the summer, we're just doing throwbacks, and so uh, a lot of throwbacks this summer. I think we're doing, we're doing a week of cow tipping. Let me ask this, how many of you have been at Real Life Church longer than five years? Hands up. Put them way up. Okay. Uh, how many have been at Real Life Church longer than... Or since uh, longer than five years, like 10 years way back. I see, I see a few hands, a few hands. All right. So some of these series you're going to, but my kids, I'm now seeing it's my kids raising their hands. We're like, we've been here since the beginning, Dad. <laughs> um, but to some of these series may be new to you, but they're throwbacks for us. We did, a, uh, like I said, cow tipping was a, a lot of fun. We did that a couple years in a row uh, where we tipped over the sacred cows of the church. And uh, we're going to do a week of cow tipping this summer. We have another one called The Elephant in the Room. Now, The Elephant in the Room series was fun. We did it at the barn next door. And uh, The Elephant in the Room series, we ordered a nine-foot inflatable pink elephant from China (laughs) when we first did this series. And we ended up putting this elephant all over town and had people taking pictures. But there was a website on the elephant that just said elephantintheroom.com. And when you went to that website, there was one question. And the one question was, what is the church not talking about? And it was just open forum. We talked, that series, we talked about everything from the transgender issue to sexual identity, uh, smoking, drinking, cussing, all those kind of fun stuff that people just had real questions about. And I love that series. I can't wait for that week to come back because we we, we're going to break the elephant back out and hide him around town and you guys are going to get to look for him again. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, but I love that because I think that the world we live in, I think there's the church and the church talks about some things that are really critical, but then there's a world outside of it that doesn't know the biblical answer to the problem they're facing. And I think this is just what I believe. I believe the Bible has an answer for every issue that's facing our world right now. For every issue that's facing our young people, for every issue that's facing your marriage, for every issue that's facing wherever you are in whatever season of life you're in, I believe the Bible has an answer for it. And so I love that series that we get to do. I know we're bringing one back that was called YOLO is a lie. When the phrase YOLO was big, we were like, no, no, that's a lie. Because uh, as a believer, we, don't, we, we get to live. There's a second birth that occurs, and because of it, I get to live for eternity with heaven, and I'm excited about it. And so this is some stuff we're bringing back this summer. We just call it the Summer of Ten. Uh, we, today, we're kicking it off with Vintage. Vintage is a way back series back from when we were at Flippin'. And at Flippin', we had a garage door in our church building right in the auditorium because we were in a pawn shop. And we pulled, a tr- we pulled an old classic Chevy truck in the, the, the sanctuary and parked it right up on the stage next to me while I was preaching and it smelled like oil the whole time it was there. And, uh, but it was a great series. And so although we couldn't get the cars parked on the stage, we got enough of them around. We even stole the van from Bunkles um, <laughs> and fit it through our doors. That was an incredible thing to watch this week. Uh, my son was with me this morning, and, and we got to drive, I, I got to drive the two cars out front to, to work this morning. And so my job is awesome. And... Uh, <laughs> It was a lot of fun. Me and Brayden had a lot of fun driving them around. But I'm excited today. We're going to talk about vintage. So when I think of vintage, we were joking. I was joking earlier in the week with Dallas about the the worship set this week. Most of those songs, Aaron mentioned in the first service, most of the songs that they just sang are 20 years old or older. And I was like, man, that doesn't seem like 20 years ago. Actually, I was thinking that that worship set didn't seem vintage. I know the worship leaders are like, what? <laughs> yes, it was. That stuff's old. When I think of vintage worship, I want to stomp a little bit and sing I'll Fly Away. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Patrick, where are you at? Raise your hand. These are my people. <laughs> No, it's, and so uh, like vintage is different for people. Uh, I was saw uh, Val, one of the, the, the girls on staff here at church, she does a great job with our graphics and, and just creative stuff, and, and she enjoys vintage clothing, and I'm like, what exactly does that mean, vintage clothing? She's like, it's got to be over, is it 20 or 25? 20 years. If it's over 20 years old, it's considered vintage, and it's worth more. How many of you have socks that are vintage? <laughs> Come on, Somebody. How many of you got some t-shirts that are vintage? Anybody got a pair of jeans that's vintage? 
got one guy just keeping his hand up. He's like, I'm there. I'm there. And his wife's like, he's not kidding. He's not. And I'll tell you, those are, I have a pair of boots that are about 25 years old that I, they're older than that, actually, now that I realize how old I am. Um, and they are the most comfortable pair of boots I have. And Val reassured me that they're not old. They're vintage. And so uh, I ain't selling them because they're too comfortable. Music is something that also is vintage. You guys know I love music. And, and depending on your, your I'm going to ask this. I got in the first sermon. It was kind of fun. How many of you are, now I, don't wanna, I don't want you to say that this is what you like, but you were actually around when it was out. All right? Because there's music I like that's older than I am. But you were around when this stuff came out. So how many of you were late 70s, early 80s journey? Yeah, okay. Hands up if that's you. Journey. All right. I'm a journey people. Any head bangers from the late 90, or late 80s, early 90s, like the Motley Crue, Guns N' Roses age? I can tell the real ones because they didn't raise their hand. They were like, yeah, like that. <laughs> they were like, <laughs> and, and then the older people are like, you shouldn't do that signal in church, Pastor Vince. It's not. Um, how many of you can go back for the Rolling Stones? Like the original. Like when Keith Richards was like 94, back <laughs> when they started. <laughs> I seen a picture the other day that showed, showed Keith Richards holding a baby, and it said a rare picture of Keith Richards holding Betty White as a child. <laughs> so that's awesome. So, such creativity. I mean, any, any Beatles people in the room? How about Elvis. I got reprimanded in the first service because I didn't mention Elvis. Literally, a lady came up to me and she said, Elvis! And I'm like, Elvis? She's like, Elvis is vintage! And I'm like, yes, he is. Elvis was a lot of things. You get into some of those late 70s Elvis and then there was just a lot of Elvis, all right? But uh, I love music and so I love... I know how you go to country music and man, that's changed. Music has changed now so radically like... How many of you would just go ahead and testify before God and man that country music today just isn't country music? I see that hand. I see that hand. I, I appreciate that. I'm a George Jones kind of, that's more my, my mom at my mom's funeral. My mom wanted my dad to play. He stopped loving her today. Some of you don't know that song. It's considered the saddest song in the history of country music. Basically, the guy dies and that's when he stopped loving his wife that left him, okay? And the uh, first time I'd seen him smile in years, as such a, and my mom wanted this plate at her funeral. And I know why she did it is because she was being honored because she was like, that's the saddest song ever. And I'm like, it is the saddest song ever, but you're, uh, mom, dad's here. And she's like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that's, that's what you want? She said, yeah. And I said, Okay, we, <laughs> we played it. Um, but uh, he stopped loving her today. Uh, even Vern Gosden, some people don't remember, know some of those older names, and Conway Twitty and some of that. And even you can go way back to Fern Williams and some of that. I like, I like old country music, and now it's not old country music. It's just different pop music um, is what I call it. But music ignites something in me. I, I grew up with all kinds of music. My dad was a Baptist preacher, but he liked to dance which is odd. Um, I've been joking all day with the brown bottles, people walking around with them. I'm like, finally the Baptists have come out of the closet. And so, <laughs> yes, I've been waiting all day for that joke. Um, I better start preaching. Um, but we're we're going to have a great time this summer. So this is your opportunity. Here's the thing. I want you to start inviting people. I want you to talk, start telling everybody. And here's the thing, we're about to get into a sermon where you're going to realize it's not my job, it's not the, the, the staff's job, it's, it's not anyone's job, it is our call. It is our mission that someone that you know would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That someone that you and I know that maybe isn't plugged into church because they got hurt a while back realizes that there's still a seat at the king's table and they can come back. And that's for you and I to walk through. We don't get to stay bitter. And I'm going to talk about this in just a moment. We don't get to stay upset. We don't get to stay moody. We, we have to be the believers that people see Christ in. And so I started talking about this idea of vintage in this sermon series that we did way back in the beginning. It's probably 11 years ago that we did this series, Vintage. And what sparked me then is still what sparks me now. There are some things that happen in church that are just principal things that are supposed to occur. 
These are just realities that are supposed to occur in church. Now, this doesn't matter whether you come from a country church and you've got wood paneling on every side and a piano on this side of the stage and an organ that no one plays on this side of the stage. How many of you grew up in that church? No one's still playing that organ, just so you know. Maybe you grew up in high church. Maybe it was an Episcopal church, a Lutheran church, something that was big and grand. And when you walked in, the stations of the cross were in the stained glass windows that surrounded the building. And there was a steeple that was a mile high that you could see anywhere in town. Or maybe it's just been recent. And you come into the church warehouse movement. And that's what we're considering. We have a warehouse building. We just put the walls where we wanted to. And, and that way we can move them if we need to. Hey, there's the reason that wall is there, because you know what? I can push into that auditorium or into the foyer and expand this room by three, four hundred chairs if I need to. It's the reason is we, we build all of it on purpose so that we could expand it if we needed to. There's a reason there's four acres back here. I can put another warehouse up pretty quick. Okay? There's a reason for these things. And so regardless of where you came out in church or came into church, all of them had great things. The principles of the vintage church have nothing to do with methodology or preference. But how many of you know we can sure get messed up over some methodology and preference? I wore a robe one time. I called one of my friends who pastors an Orthodox church here in town. And one Sunday I called him. I said, hey, I, I, want, I want to wear your robe. He's like, you don't wear a robe, you wear jeans. I'm like, I'm going to wear jeans under the robe? <laughs> I said, can I borrow one? He said, why? I said, because I need to rattle the cage of some of my people, some of our folks. He said, you're going to wear one of my, I was, yeah, and I want the nice one. He's like, these are really expensive. I said, okay, then give me the cheap one. <laughs> Man, this thing was long and it had three layers and it was beautifully done. It was ornate. And I walked out of the back and I come out on the stage like this and the whole room went <gasps> and got dead quiet. And I said, here's the issue we have in modern church. Is that we all think we do it right. Instead of all of us just worshiping the one who gave his life. That's it. There are churches that I could go into this morning and I would be in way underdressed. There are churches right now that I could go into where I'm still the best dressed one there. And that's okay because it's not ever been about methodology or preference. Uh, uh, we were joking about music earlier and, and, and I love modern worship music, but I grew up in a different, I grew up, I love, I love Southern gospel music. I love certain gospel music that, you know, in my car, I'm, I'm sitting there singing I'll Fly Away and Amazing Grace and some of that stuff. You know, I could probably still quote you the page numbers from the Heavenly Highway Hymnal. Because that's what I grew up with. That feel. And here's the thing. It's not that I prefer that style of music. It just feels like home. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Certain things feel like home. The problem is, here's the, here's the problem the church gets into, is we get established in our preferences for church because it feels like home. But yet the word of God says this world is not our home. In fact, the old hymn said we're just uh, passing through. And so I, I want to talk today about the principles that make a church, not the preferences that make a church. These are things that ought to be happening in every church, no matter the creed, no matter what. If they're a gospel preaching, they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He was crucified and raised again for the remission of my sin, and one day he's coming back to take me home to live with him eternally. If they teach that message, then I'm on their team. I'm on their team. I want them to win. I want them to succeed. I want them to experience this vintage church feel. So here we go, diving into this. There are three things, and the first thing is Acts chapter 2 is where we're going to be. So Acts chapter 2, what happens is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit shows up, mighty rushing wind, well, all thing, everything breaks loose on this day of Pentecost. Peter gets outside, the Spirit of God is on him, he jumps up, he preaches a sermon, and thousands turn their hearts and lives over to Jesus Christ. First sermon. My first sermon was not good. <laughs> you don't hear that every Sunday in church, do you? <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, <sighs> aren't y'all glad you came to church today? All right. 
So there's thousands of people that were saved. And then we get to the end of Acts chapter 2, and it begins to just give us this overview description of what the early church looked like. From verse 40, 42 to 47, that's where we're going to be. And it's going to be up here with me, okay? Verse 42 to 47, we begin to see this def definition of the church. And I'm going to give you three things, all right? The first thing is this, is that the early church grew together. There was growth that happened in the early church. Let me tell you why. I'm just going to give you the Cliff Notes version of why there was growth in the early church. It's because when the gospel of Jesus Christ impacts you, it cannot help but impact those around you. If the Spirit of God hits your heart and changes your life, if you are doing it right, you say, Vince, it's not about what I do. No, listen, if you have been impacted by the power of Jesus Christ, it cannot help but to impact others. If you got saved and you went home, guess what? Your home will change. If you get saved and you go to work, your workplace ought to change because growth is the only, it's the byproduct of the gospel. And people say, well, no, 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 it's not all about numerical growth. There's nothing about numerical growth on here. It just says growth. If you're a believer, you ought not be the same believer today that you were when you started. There ought to be growth that occurs. Here's what happens in the passage. This is what it says. And all the believers, how many of the believers, church? All of them devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. They came together. They got together. They had church together. They went to church together. When they weren't at church together, they were at home having church together. That was the type of thing that was happening with this early church model. They learned how to be the church by being at church. You go, well, yeah, Vince, it's not all about attendance. It's not all about attendance, but I will tell you the Bible's pretty clear about attendance. And not, nobody likes this. Every, you know, well, yeah, Vince, you're here every Sunday. I know. And I love being here every Sunday. I love getting to high five you and see you and shake your hand. And I understand that things come up. But the reality is Hebrews is very clear on this, just as this is very clear. They devoted themselves to being together. It was a decision that they made that said, no, this isn't just something I do. It's a choice I'm making to be together. Hebrews says to forsake not the assembly. Do not forsake the assembling together as some people do. But you should be together even more so as the day of the Lord draws nigh. We should be getting together more often as it gets closer to Jesus' return. So there's a, real, there's a real thing here about the idea of growth in the church. But what happens to growth in the church is we get into a church and we get, man, we like that church. And man, there's some energy in that church. And Pastor Vince makes me laugh. And so I like to go to that church. But the reality is church growth doesn't happen because you have an amazing pastor. One. Thank you. One. If you'll see me after church, I'll get you your t-shirt, okay? Um, <laughs> no, it happens when the people of God are impacted by the person of God and they begin living out the purpose of God. Because see, the thing is, when you get impacted by Jesus, you have to tell somebody. You've got to come see this. You've got to be a part of it. Some of you have been here a long time at Real Life Church. No one understands this because we've lived it out. We lived it out when we were in the horse barn and we went from 250 people to 980 people in an 18 month window. That didn't make sense to anybody. It didn't make sense on a national level. We were getting calls from all kinds of people across the country going, hey, what's happening? We see what's going on here. You may be one of the fastest growing country churches in the country. I said, that's really great, but I don't have time because I got to figure out what we're going to do Sunday with it. 50 extra people. <laughs> and we put them everywhere. We had chairs out into the foyer. This building was supposed to be built five years after we went into the horse barn. And this building was supposed to be half its size. That was the original plan. But growth happens when the gospel of Jesus Christ impacts the people to impact others. And so when we see this growth, it's because, hey, I'm excited about what God's doing in my life. I'm excited about what Jesus is doing in me, and I can't help but tell you what he's done in me. Some of you can remember, and I can even remember, we've had this in the last year, where there'll be 20 people up here at an altar needing prayer, or asking, coming forward saying, God, I've got something broken in my life, and you're the only one I know to fix it. Those are the kind of things that we ought to be expecting at church. We have a baptism at the end of service today. That's something that right now, let me just tell you, church, you are the exception, not the rule. The rule is we have three baptisms a year. You all expect three baptisms a week. 
Why? Because that's what happens in a church that says, God, we want you to get the glory. We want the community to change. Why? Because the gospel has impacted me, and I can't help but impact others with it. But are you? Are you seeing growth in your personal life? Or did you get saved at a vacation Bible school, remember pieces of John 3.16, and in all actuality, that's still the believer you are today. Has growth occurred in you? Because it's a basic principle of the church, of the vintage church. We got together so that we could grow. Well, Vince, I got stuff. Here's what happened. This is what the early church went through in order to grow. It says this in Hebrews. Some were teased, jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by being stoned. Some were sawed in half. Others were killed by the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. That doesn't make a lot of sense to some people. Let me explain that to you. When the sacrifices would come to the temple, you weren't allowed to use the skins. And so they would discard the skins outside the city gate. These sacrificial things, they would skin them and set the skins outside the city gate. But the Christians had been pushed out. They had been ostracized by their communities, by their cities. And so what they had to wear was the trash that was left over from the pagan worship. That's what they wore. Why would they go through that, Pastor Vince? Why would they do that? So they could get closer to Jesus and grow. That was what they went through in order to grow, in order to come together and be together so that they could learn more about Jesus Christ. And, we, and to do that, we got to be together. There's a real tangible piece that community matters in a church body, and it mattered just as much then. And these people were ostracized. And then it went on and said they were too good for this world. I love this part here. They were too good for this world. In the King James, if you have a King James Bible, we're going to go vintage this morning. If you have a King James Bible, it says this. The world was not worthy of them. Them, the world was not worthy of. And when I read that, it just gut punched me. And I wondered if there was going to be anyone at the end of my life that said, you know what? It's right that he's gone. Because this world wasn't worthy of the believer that he is. I don't know that that's what's going to be said. I think I do an okay job. I think, I think there are days I nail it and then days I miss it horribly. Anybody with me on that? But these the world was not worthy of, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. That was just their existence. That was their existence, was to just to go suffer in order to grow. And we have it open for us. You can come in here any time through the week and pray and study. And, and, and there's opportunities to grow in different things. You, life groups are coming back. Internships available for growth in ministry. I mean, there's so many opportunities. And we go, oh, so busy. Look at the time. The early church grew. The early church grew. Second thing the early church did was this. They liked each other. They liked each other. Any of y'all ever been in a church where they didn't like each other? <laughs> Look at the person next to you and say, I like you. Now look at the person you didn't like as much and tell them, you too. <laughs> How many of you, let's just do this by a show of hands. How many of you have been in church where there's been a horror story? In the words of the biblical writer, this ought not be. This ought not be. There's a community element in the church that they liked each other. They just cared for each other and says this, a deep sense of awe came over them. 
And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. I love that first line. I, I get it that the apostles and the disciples performed miracles and wonders, and that was great. But I love the first line. It says there was a deep sense of awe that came over him, them. And here's the reality. When you are so overwhelmed by Jesus, you don't have time to be underwhelmed by people. When you are so enamored by what Jesus Christ has done in your life, guess what? How many of you know people are disappointing? Say amen. Let's just be honest with each other. How many of at some point in your life have been the disappointment? And so I, I, I got no room to throw stones at this person, especially if I am so overwhelmed with what Jesus has done in my life, and I'm so overwhelmed by the grace that he's offered me and the forgiveness and the mercy that he's poured out on me. I don't have time to sweat the small stuff. But man, we all got a story of how one church split over the color of the carpet or we didn't like that they put a screen in the church or they stopped using the red hymnal instead of the black hymnal and I don't know if I'm going back. And all the while, our neighbors are going to hell. But you see, I got a preference and that matters. Jennifer and I were in a business meeting one time. I wasn't the pastor of the church. I was actually going to see. They'd asked me to come and to preach and to consider being the pastor of the church. And we're sitting in a business meeting. And uh, this lady sitting there. I was young. I think I was maybe 26 when we were at this church. This lady sat there and she crossed her arms. It was a meeting like this. They put me on a stool in front of the congregation. And said, does anyone have questions for the young new pastor? And I'm like, young pastor, I haven't said yes. This lady crossed her arms and she scowled at me and she said, what are you going to do if I get mad at you, Pastor Vince? And again, I was young, not a lot of intelligence. I said, well, I guess, ma'am, you can get happy. In the same pants you get mad in. (laughs) Yeah, don't clap. I didn't take that, church. Uh, (laughs) No, actually, that lady, I did take that church. And she stared at me for a second. And then this big old grin creeped across her face. She smiled. She ended up being one of our, me and Jennifer's greatest friends there. She watched our kids when they were babies. Great relationship. We sat in another business one time when the, the, the deacon got up there. He was moderating the meeting. He'd come to order. He said, we really only have one item of business this, this, this month. They were having a monthly business meeting. And I said, okay, here we go. And I sat next to Jennifer. And he said, uh, first item of business, we need to, I need a motion on the floor that we go ahead and pay this month's electric bill. And I'm sitting there confused. And I'm sure it was all over my face. And there we go. I make a motion that we pay this month's electric bill. I second that motion. Any discussion on that? And I looked at Jennifer, and I'm sitting there with my arms crossed, and I said, is there some part of you that just wants to vote no right now? (laughs) Let's not pay it. See what happens. (laughs) I wasn't a member of the church, so they wouldn't let me vote. Man, we get so messed up about stuff that's this big when we are the proprietors of a message that's as big as eternity. Don't be that church. Be a vintage church. When they would walk by people, hey, where are you going? I'm going to church. You should come with me. Well, I've got that. No, no, no. You don't have anything as important as this. You should come with me. Well, it's the lake and it's Sunday and I know and you can be there in an hour and a half because we're only going to take about an hour of your time. If you'll show up, they'll even give you glass bottles to drink out. It'll be fantastic. You can't make. you got to come be a part of what's happening. you got to come see this. Why? Because the preacher's funny. No. Why? Because the music's great. No. Because there is a Jesus Christ that you need to be introduced to because he is the only one that will change your eternity. We have got to be that church and we've got to like each other in the process we got to like each other in the process please for the love here listen to me on this for the for the love of the kingdom of god do not be a sour grumpy disgruntled christian you are doing heaven no favors you just aren't Vince, sometimes we got to get serious about it i believe the gospel is the most serious thing that i will ever proclaim in my life I'll say this honestly with you because I've had to have this conversation with God. More important, more important than how I raise my kids is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
more important than how I love my wife is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, oh, Vince, I don't know about that. It doesn't matter to me if you know I know what the Bible says. What I do know is that if I will proclaim and live out the gospel correctly, then the other two will take care of themselves. But so many times we get things in front of it and instead we put God on this list where, you know, it's, and we all know the Sunday school answer, God first, my, my work, my, my family, then my job, and then my hobbies. No, 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 no. Well, Vince, where is it? Do I put God somewhere down below my family? No, 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 no. God better be in every category in your list from top to bottom or you're still missing. He better be in your family. He better be in your job. He better be in your hobbies. He better be in everything that you do or you missed what the gospel truly means. And we got to like each other in the process. I love church. I love church. I love every aspect of it. I even love the broken ones. The second pastor that I took, the pastor walked up to me before he left. He preached his last sermon and he walked out and he caught me and he said, Brother Vince? I said, yeah. He said, are you considering to be the pastor? I said, yes, sir. He took me by the arm and he said, listen to me. He said, before I leave this church, I will burn it to the ground and you won't have anything to put back together and walked away. Don't be that church. The reason people stay away from the church is because of stuff like that. Where they can't see the love of Jesus in any of us because we're too busy fighting about the stuff that doesn't make any difference in heaven. So what did they have? They had growth. They had community. But the reason they had healthy growth and healthy community is because they had one mission. One mission, one purpose. And that was Jesus. Listen to what it says. They worshiped together at the temple each day. Each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity. If I were to ask you how your coworkers would describe your Christianity, would they describe it as joy and generosity? Is that how your world sees you? Is that how your customers see you, full of joy and generosity? Is that how your students see you, teacher, joy and generosity? Is that, how, is that how your coworkers, is that how your co-students, is that how your family sees you? Joy and generosity would be the descriptors because that's what happens in the early church, this vintage church. The mission caused them to focus on the main thing. And when you're focusing on people getting saved, I can remember moments where we would have 20, 30, 40 people at an altar and then we would go to the spring and baptize 30, 40, 50 people. We showed up one Sunday, we were going to baptize 40 people. We had 40 people on the list. By the time we left, we'd baptize 72. Because people were watching what was going on, and they would find themselves moving to the tent and go, I don't know what's going on, but I just feel like I need something different. And they would, at that moment, next to the riverbank, give their heart and life to Christ, walk down in whatever clothes they had on. It didn't matter to me. By the fourth one, I was numb from the hips down. I could have stayed all day. But we baptize people and then we baptize the next one and life change begin to occur. That's the mission. It's not about, man, I, I really am not sure I like this song or I didn't really care that he's got this screen on stage or I didn't really care for this. Why do we have cars out front? We're just kind of creating a circus there. I'll do anything short of sin to save your lost friends. Anything. If it took me on my face begging them to receive Christ, I am not too proud because I know my Savior. If he was not too proud to hang on my cross, God forbid I let anything stand in the way of me serving him. And they worshiped together. The temple each day and they met in homes, shared supper, and shared meals with great joy and generosity the end of this chapter says that the Lord added daily while all the while praising God enjoying the good will of all people each day each day 
The Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. It wasn't a Sunday morning at an altar. It could have been a Tuesday afternoon at a coffee shop. It could have been a Thursday in a, by a school locker. It could be at your, right there under the rack where you're changing oil at your job. At that moment, in that place, the Spirit of God can move. But are we willing to receive that when it happens? I pray there's a moment you have to shut the mower off because your neighbor walked by and the Spirit of God is so heavy, it breaks them. And you happen to be in the right place at the right time to introduce them to Jesus. This is, the, this is that vintage church. It wasn't about all the stuff we had. Why do you think we still keep it plain in here? We have gray walls, a black ceiling, and a concrete floor. Because none of this stuff matters if it's not Jesus at the front of it. It doesn't matter unless it's Christ that we proclaim. It doesn't matter unless we are defined by the world as those full of joy and generosity. Why? Because they're nice people? No, because they serve an almighty God. That's why we are who we are. Is that who you are? Are you vintage? Are you the good stuff? I don't get to answer the question. I don't, I don't get to put the words in your mouth. You, you know right now in your heart what the answer is. <laughs>